in order to get in order to continue moving through the Mishnah, we need a couple more psukim. We need a couple more verses. And we're always in the 16th chapter, by the way, of Vayikra. So there's this one chapter which is in which has all the roots of the the um, the ritual of Yom Kippur, the the process of Yom Kippur. And I brought it at the top of the source sheet, but every so often we need to zero in on a couple of verses. And so I, I just extracted a couple of verses um, for you today. He goes out to the altar that is before the Lord. This is after he's done the sprinklings. He's going to go out to the altar that's before the Lord. And then he's going to love he's going to somehow make atonement for this altar and then he's going to take the blood of the bull and the goat and he's going to put it around the horns of the altar and he's going to do another sprinkling and then once he's done that he's going to go back to the goat the live goat the goat that's going to be sent away to the desert so we need to find out well what is this altar that's before the lord what altar are we talking about here and the sages are going to go back to another pasuk that we've already mentioned, by the way, in Shmot, about the incense altar. You shall make an altar for burning incense. That's the command to Moshe. And Aaron's going to burn the incense on it. Aaron's going to burn the incense on this altar. And he's going to burn it when he lights the lights. We talked about this when we talked about offering the incense at around the same time that we offer the tamid sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. When he, when Aaron burns the, when when Aaron lights the lights, he's going to burn the incense at in the evening. Hashem, a regular incense offering lifnei Hashem before God. So this incense altar seems to be. Before God, it's Lifnei Hashem. And the rabbis will pick that up when they want to fulfill the command to find Hashem. He shall go out to the altar that's Lifnei Hashem, that's before the Lord. So the sages deduce that this is the incense altar. It's not the regular, it's not an altar that we sacrifice animals on. It's an incense altar. It's just used for, for burning the incense. And the Mishnah is then going to pick up. So we're now in the fifth Mishnah of the fifth chapter. We're just, just over halfway through the Masachet. The Mishnah is going to pick up by quoting our Pasuk. Hashem. He shall go out to the altar that's before the Lord. This is the golden altar. And the Mishnah is referring to the incense altar, which is actually... It's uh, it's covered with beaten gold. So it's an acacia altar, but it's covered with beaten gold. This is the incense altar. He begins to purify and he goes down. The word machate is really interesting here. I mean, the root chata means to sin. So what is it? But all the translators say, look, in, in this context, it means to purify. He 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 begins to sin or he begins to purify. Jastro helps us here. I brought you Jastro on the source sheet. So Jastro says that the root chata in the PL, chetet aleph, can make, can mean to look well, to polish, to dress, to cleanse or prepare. That's his meaning one. And then in meaning two, he actually says, you know, chata means to sin. We know that. But it also means to expiate, to cleanse from sin. Chata is to sin and chite is to cleanse from sin. And he doesn't explain why he says this, whether this is an example of euphemism. Sometimes the Mishnah uses a, a meaning, a word with the opposite meaning from the one it intends. So, for example, a blind man is someone who sees much light. I don't know. But anyway, the 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 scent, the Mishnah, the words of the Mishnah is he starts to whether that's to sin 
or to expiate from sin. And everyone translates that as he begins to purify. There you're read. And he works down. So what, what does working down mean? So where does he begin from? So he starts from the northeast horn. Now these altars are these altars are horned. Over the direction north and east and west, you know. Mm -hmm. These are Yoma. These, these altars are horned. So they've got funny sticking up things on each corner. And I, I was I was looking for I've seen a horned altar in Petra myself, but I was looking for a photo of it today, but I couldn't really find one. You can see if you Google horned altar or horned altars, you'll see reconstructions of them, you know, plenty on the Internet. But I, I couldn't find a real one for you. But essentially, they've got four stone spikes coming up at the four corners. And the Mishnah calls these horns, Karen. So he starts from the northeast horn, and then he goes Tsvonit um, Maravit, Maravit Dromit, Dromit Mizrachit. He goes northwest, southwest, then southeast. So he he turns to the right as he goes round the altar. In fact, there's an idea today actually that the Baal Tefillah, for example, will always turn to to the right if he's holding the Sefer Torah. He's carrying it around the shul. He's going to turn to the right. Just like the Kohen Gadol used to turn to the right when he's purifying the golden altar. And that is actually where he began to um, sacrifice the sin offering on the outer altar. The outer altar is the altar with the ramp where all of the offerings are sacrificed. Rabbi Eliezer says, Rabbi Eliezer has a different, a slightly different take on this. Rabbi Eliezer says, Bim komo haya omed umchate. Rabbi Eliezer says, look, he stands in one place and sprinkles, as if the sense of the rest of the Mishnah is that he should actually walk round, walk round to the right. But the, the whole Mishnah is only about the, the, the incense altar is only one ama square. It's only 18 inches square. So it's pretty simple for him to reach over it, going from corner to corner. And then Rabbi Eliezer continues. Um, I'm, Rabbi Eliezer continues. Uh, so he says, He would remain in his place and purify. He'd sprinkle from below upwards. Chutz. Except for the corner that was facing him, from that one he'd sprinkle up towards down. What does he do next? He sprinkles the surface of the altar seven times. Again, we've got this word which might be euphemistic. He's al tahoro shel He sprinkles. Well, tahoro literally means the purity. He sprinkles on the purity of the altar, but were the, again, and Jasher is clear that he seems to refer here to the surface. So in other words, he's going to clear away the ashes, the old incense, the old stuff that's burnt from the incense altar, and he's going to sprinkle this blood just on the very surface, on the clean surface of it. And I'm struck by the fact that, you know, we've had the word chata in, that seems to be in euphemism in the previous Mishnah, and the word tahor, pure, which seems to be again in euphemism in this Mishnah. He sprinkles on the surface of the altar seven times. And then he takes the remainder of the blood. He's got, he's, he's got a lot of blood in the bowl. Uh, this is the blood that he has mixed together. Remember, he he finishes up by that we learnt in the previous mission. He mixes up the blood of the bull and the goat. He's got a lot of blood in the bowl. About we said it's about a gallon actually. And he's going to go onto the outer altar and he's going to pour it out on the southern base. Elu 
Oh, he's going to pour it out on the southern base. When he sacrifices a regular sacrifice. Sorry. He pour it out on the western base of the outer altar. On the regular sacrifices, which he sacrifices on the outer altar, he pours those out on the southern base. And same, by the way, on Yom Kippur, right? This, he's referring to the regular sacrifices on Yom Kippur. And both of these kind of streams of blood, they sort of mingle. They had um, channels carved into the floor of the temple. They'd mingle in the channel or in the aqueduct. And they'd flow out in Nachal Kidron. Nachal Kidron is the, the stream outside Temple Mount. And they were sold to gardeners as manure. So this is really high quality, high protein stuff, this blood. So they'd sell it to the gardeners for manure. And the law of Me'ila, we can't misuse temporal property. So the law of Me'ila applies here. The gardeners weren't just allowed to take the blood and use it for manure. They had to buy it. So essentially by buying the manure, they hand over the money. The money then becomes holy. The manure becomes coal, becomes ordinary. And then they can take the blood and they can use it as manure for their gardening. And the chapter then concludes. This is the last Mishnah in the chapter, and we, we've you know we said many times before the last Mishnah is significant. The last Mishnah declares Kol Masay Yom Kippurim Hamur Al Haseder Im Hikdim Masay Lachavero Lo Asachlum. With every act of Yom Kippur which is mentioned in a prescribed order. And of course, the Pesukim, the verses of chapter 16, they all mention a specific order in which everything has to happen. With any act that has to be done in the prescribed order, if he performed it before its fellow, i.e. if he got it out of order, he hasn't done anything at all. In other words, the, the order, it, it's not sufficient just to perform all of these acts. They have to be done in the right way. They have to be done in the right sequence. They have to be done thoughtfully and purposefully, we might say. We don't do things randomly on Yom Kippur. We go through in a certain way. And then, of course, the Mishnah is then going to ask, well, what happens if he made a mistake? And of course, we've seen many, many chapters of Mishnah which deal with what happens when people make a mistake. So what if he deals with the blood of the goat before the blood of the bull? Remember, we learned the bull goes first. He must start all over again. That probably means slaughtering another goat, by the way, and sprinkling the blood of the goat after the blood of the bull. If before he'd finished sprinkling within, this means within the Holy of Holies, Nishpach Adam. The blood was spilt away. I think this refers to a mistake, and he spills the whole bowl. So he can't finish the sprinkling. He has to bring another bowl of blood. And then he has to restart all of the inside sprinklings. And similarly, in the Heichal and with the Golden Altar, each act is an act on its own. And if for some reason he um, he makes a mistake, he has to start the whole thing over and over again. Although Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon are going to disagree, Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon on Rim, Bimkom she pasak, misham hu matchil. Actually, they say, look, wherever he stops, he can pick up again. And maybe again, that's a from where he stopped, he can pick up again. Yeah, maybe there's a lesson for sort of Yom Kippur there as well.